Welcome to the OrthoClips podcast series and our little mini-series on the Ortho Time Machine episodes where we journey through the pivotal moments in orthopedic surgery history. I'm Saqib Rahman, and today we're focusing on a game-changing innovation that transformed the way surgeons diagnose and treat joint disorders. We're talking about arthroscopy, a minimally invasive procedure that gave orthopedic surgeons a new way to see and treat inside the joints without making large incisions. It's hard to imagine modern orthopedics without arthroscopy, whether it's repairing a torn meniscus, reconstructing an ACL, doing a rotator cuff repair, dealing with shoulder impingement. Arthroscopy has become a cornerstone in our field. But how did it all begin? Who were the pioneers that made it possible? And what were the challenges along the way? So join me as we dive into the fascinating story of arthroscopy, its early skeptics, and the visionary surgeons who saw its potential. Our story begins in the early 20th century with a Japanese surgeon named Dr. Kenji Takagi. In 1918, Takagi was fascinated by the idea of being able to visualize inside a joint. He was inspired by advancements in cystoscopy, which is a procedure used to examine the inside of a bladder using small tube-like cameras at the time. So Takagi wondered, could a similar technique be applied to the knee joint? So using a cystoscope and rudimentary light sources, he performed the first arthroscopic examination on a cadaver knee. The view was dim and blurry, but it was a start, and Takagi documented his findings meticulously and continued to refine his techniques. Takagi later wrote, quote, the knee joint is a mystery. If we can see inside, we can understand it better and treat it more precisely, unquote. Despite his groundbreaking work, Takagi's discoveries remained largely confined to Japan, His early attempts at arthroscopy were seen as more of a curiosity than a viable surgical tool. So it wasn't until the 1950s that Takagi's student, Dr. Masaki Watanabe, carried the torch forward. Watanabe believed that arthroscopy could revolutionize orthopedics, but he knew that significant technological advancements were needed. So one of Watanabe's first major improvements was the development of the Watanabe number 21 arthroscope, which featured a much wider field of view and better illumination. And this device became the prototype for modern arthroscopes as we know them today. So Watanabe began using arthroscopy not just for diagnosis, but then also for therapeutic procedures. In 1959, he published the first comprehensive textbook on arthroscopy, describing over 280 cases. He even included photographs of arthroscopic images, which was a novelty at the time. So Watanabe's work has earned him the title of father of modern arthroscopy, but even he faced resistance. Many surgeons dismissed arthroscopy as impractical and unnecessary, Watanabe recalled, quote, they told me that no patient would ever want a tube stuck into their joint. I told them that patients would prefer it to a large incision. He was right, of course, but it would take years before arthroscopy gained widespread acceptance. By the 1960s and 70s, arthroscopy began to make its way to Europe and the United States, but the road was anything but smooth. Early adopters like Dr. Robert W. Jackson, a Canadian surgeon who had trained with Watanabe in Japan, and Dr. Lanny Johnson in the U.S. faced considerable skepticism. So Dr. Jackson was one of the first to bring arthroscopy to North America. He was visiting Japan with the Canadian Olympic team, uh, and he had trained under Watanabe, and he vividly recalled reactions of his colleagues back home. Quote, they thought I was wasting time playing with fancy gadgets. 
They couldn't see why anyone would choose arthroscopy over an open procedure, end quote. So the main challenge? Well, the technology was still in its infancy, to be fair, at the time. Early arthroscopes often fogged up, provided poor illumination. I mean, you got to remember, you didn't have all the cameras and HD TVs like you had today. You were looking directly through the end of a scope yourself. So there was limited maneuverability as well. And furthermore, most surgeons were unfamiliar with the technique, so training opportunities were scarce. But Jackson and others persevered. They believed that arthroscopy offered not only a diagnostic advantage, but also the potential for far less invasive treatments with faster recovery times. So one of the turning points for arthroscopy came in the 1970s with the rise of sports medicine as we know it today. Professional athletes who needed to return to peak performance as quickly as possible became early beneficiaries of the arthroscopic surgical techniques and this new field. Take the case of Gale Sayers, the legendary running back for the Chicago Bears. Gale Sayers, the superstar. He cuts, weaves, stops, and goes. He runs with power and precision. In 1970, Sayers tore his meniscus in his knee, an injury that could have ended his career. Traditional open surgery would have required months of rehabilitation, but Sayers opted for an arthroscopic procedure performed by Dr. Lanny Johnson. Johnson used an arthroscope to essentially debride his torn meniscus, allowing him to return to play far sooner than expected. The success of this case, with Sayers as famous of a figure that he was in the sports world, sent shockwaves throughout the sports world, and athletes from all disciplines started seeking out arthroscopy for their injuries. Dr. Johnson later reflected, quote, Arthroscopy was a game changer for athletes. It allowed us to treat their injuries without sidelining them for an entire season. End quote. Another high profile case involved Bobby Orr, the Boston Bruins hockey star, widely considered one of the greatest players in NHL history. Back in front door, shot, score! Orr had recurrent knee injuries that threatened to derail his career. Dr. James Andrews, noted orthopedic sports medicine surgeon, performed multiple arthroscopic procedures on Orr, prolonging his time on the ice. Andrews once said, quote, without arthroscopy, the careers of many athletes would have been cut short. It allowed us to see things we couldn't before and treat injuries with far greater precision, unquote. By the 1980s, technological advancements in fiber optics and camera systems made arthroscopy more accessible and reliable. So surgeons could now project HD images onto monitors, giving them crystal clear views inside the joint. These innovations helped arthroscopy move from a niche technique to a mainstream surgical tool. And we now see arthroscopy being done in numerous joints. The establishment of professional organizations like the Arthroscopy Association of North America, or ANA, further cemented its place in orthopedics as a specialty. Training programs and conferences proliferated to this day, allowing a new generation of surgeons to master these techniques. Today, arthroscopy is a cornerstone of orthopedic surgery. It's used to treat a wide range of conditions from torn ligaments and cartilage damage to more complex joint reconstructions. It's dramatically reduced recovery times, minimized surgical risks, and improved outcomes for millions of patients. Reflecting on its journey, Dr. Robert Jackson once wrote, quote, arthroscopy wasn't just an evolution in surgery, it was a revolution. It changed the way we think about joints and how we treat them. Arthroscopy has come a long way from the dim, blurry images of Takagi's early experiments to the high-definition procedures we see today. It's a testament to the power of innovation, persistence, and the unwavering desire to improve patient care. Thanks for joining us today on this journey, again through the Ortho Time Machine. In our next episode, we'll explore another transformative moment in orthopedics, the development of total knee arthroplasty. 
See you then.